well, I thought I'd direct your attention first to this event that I went to on Monday with friends of the show, Harrison Pitt and uh, Lewis Brackpool. And thank you to everyone there who decided to come up and shake my hand and thank me and all my colleagues for all the work we're doing at lotuseaters.com. But this event in the Emmanuel Center was run. It was on, is immigration good for Britain? And it was marketed as the debate of our time. And it had Matt Goodwin, academic at the University of Kent, author of Values, Voice and Virtue, who I have spoken to about his book. You can Watch that down in the description below. Constant Kissing, obviously, friend of the show, her co host of Trigonometry. My episode with him will be out on Sunday, versus Aaron Bastani, co founder of Navarra Media. It was a very confusing political journey. I mean, he once told me in the GB News Green Room that reactionary politics makes sense. So perhaps just being a dad and seeing the decay of his local high street might push him to the far right eventually, um, judging by what he said at this event. I'm not yet convinced that he's there. And Polly Toynbee. Now, Polly Toynbee, for those who don't know, is the granddaughter of Arnold Toynbee, the famous theorist of cyclical history. You can learn more about him in the Prophets of Doom book that Nima Parvini, the academic agent, wrote recently. Uh, it's sort of consolidation of some of his writings. I spoke to Nima about his book again on the book club section of the website. Toynbee was a former SDP activist before the SDP got dismantled and incorporated into the Liberal Democrats, has now been a Labour supporter, writes for The Guardian on behalf of Keir Starmer doing puff pieces, and very interestingly is the secretary of the Fabian Society. Now, we spoke about the Fabian Society before, the 19th century body that wanted to achieve socialism through incremental change and subversion of democratic processes. And if you think I'm lying about that, well, are you really going to trust an organization whose logo used to be a wolf in sheep's clothing? So Toynbee, I think, I don't think she's actually smart enough to play dumb in this debate, but if she were playing dumb, uh, she has the track record and associations to do so. Now, why am I talking about this? Well, because this was marketed as the debate of our time. And I agree that the issue is very prominent. It's a uh, gravitational well around which all of politics seems to be orbiting these days, whether or not the elite like it or not, and whether or not they want to label it as divisive. Well, that's what moderator Katie Ball said when she introduced all of the uh, panelists. But Matt Goodwin decided to say, and, and quite rightly so, that upwards of, I think it's 86% of constituencies in the country, per a recent Onward report that we've already discussed on the podcast, want immigration restrictions to be tightened and fewer people in the country. And that's based on the premise that they think that net migration is 70,000 a year, not nearly 700,000 a year. So even by underestimating it to the factor of 10, the amount of immigrants coming to the country, people still want immigration to be restricted. So it's not divisive, it's actually pretty unanimous. And so was the audience. So Shock, communists don't really spend money. Barely anyone from Novara was there. But there were about four people who put their hands up at the start and the end of the debate that said immigration is good for Britain. There were a couple of hundred people there that nearly unanimously put up their hands saying it is a net detriment. A few floaty voters in the middle, probably reading the Times or listening to the BBC still. God bless them, hope they find a cure. Now, the reason I'm talking about it, again, is because it's marketed as the debate of our time. Important, important issue but what does debate actually achieve? This was a question I asked in my Telegraph write-up for the piece, actually. Um, not Telegraph write-up, rather, critic write-up. I haven't quite written for the Telegraph yet. I mean, uh, aspiration, but uh, you know, last time they ran an article on me, it wasn't exactly favourable. They didn't even get comment. But anyway, point being, critic write-up. And I made the point, actually, uh, it's down towards the bottom of the article, but this felt like sitting in about 410 AD, listening to a bunch of Roman senators saying, oh, it might not have been the best idea to hire all those Visigoths to staff our army. You know, the barbarians are already well within the gates and nobody has the political gumption to turf them out. Polly Toynbee, I think she ultimately won this debate even though Matt and Constantine put on a really good show, and I'll, I'll detail some of their comments shortly, because she represents the establishment position, which is, and, and in no uncertain terms, she said, nobody has worked out a way to get rid of all these illegal immigrants yet, so you might as well stop being nice to them. Right, so they broke into your country, and now you are obliged, because the only people capable of turfing them out, because the state has a monopoly on violence, are unwilling to turf them out, you are obliged to fork over all of your money and pay for their bed and board, because some adventurer is now just here in perpetuity. She, she speaks about it as if it's an inevitability, but also, even though it's undesirable, it's also somehow our strength, and as Rishi Sunak will put on a 50p coin, no doubt again, uh, somehow built Britain. So the diversity needs to be imported, but also it was already here, but also Britain was terrible before it was here, but also they are the ones that made Britain. It's never meant to make sense. The, the, the point is, even these logical arguments that Matt, Constantine, and myself and my co-hosts make on the podcast, The Lotus Caesars, even though they are abundant and persuasive, uh, if people have 
closed ears to the issue, nothing will really happen. So quick, quick summary of what happened. Constantine got up first. And I know lots of people think that Constantine is a bit of a centrist dad. I mean, I spoke to him this morning and he said he identifies as a centrist. That's what he is. Uh, I carefully reminded him that I'm also just a normal person from before the French Revolution. It's funny how times change. Uh, But Constantine gave the most forthright repudiation of cultural differences during the debate, which I was quite happy with. I had a skeptical friend along with me uh, who is let's say, far more right-wing than Constantine is, and he was pleasantly surprised. So uh, well done, Mr. Kissing. And he said, started off with a provocative framing, saying that he loves immigration almost as much as he loves ice cream. Now, I was concerned that we were going down the left of the real racists route here, but he then decided to say that, as in the case of Abdul Azizi, if ice cream had started throwing acid on a woman and her two toddlers, he might stop eating ice cream. They might actually actively campaign against ice cream existing. So fair, fair enough. Uh, he also remarked on the cultural differences between immigrants by saying, and I quote, um, after we took in lots of genuine refugees from Hong Kong and Ukraine, hopefully with the aim at repatriating them once the conditions of their homelands are sufficiently peaceful that they can go home to the place they would rather live, um, after taking in hundreds of thousands of those people, we, we don't, quote, have any Hong Kongese grooming gangs. Pretty important point. I mean, yes, large amounts of numbers will stress any public service that they decide to interact with, but more to the point of Eric Kaufman's book, White Shift, again, interview with him, I'll link it down in the description. It's not just a question of procedures, because once you start framing the immigration debate as well, it's public services, and it's just purely about quantity, and it's stress on housing, and the NHS, and the roads, and sewage. Okay, hypothetically, if we could optimize the technology to the point of where we could 3D print flat-packed battery farms, and house everyone in very confined but operational living in perpetuity, why should I want to turn my entire country into megacity one? Well, because these people hold ethnic prejudices and cultural incompatibilities and a certain historical baggage if they're coming over from places like Pakistan and India, a grievance against the empire in many, many cases. I mean, look at Narinda talking to Carl. As soon as she went from we the British, uh, talking about the good things about Britain she likes, like the diversity and the fact that London's barely even English anymore, so she feels more at home, unlike in a room full of white people. She then goes to, well, I'm actually Indian, the moment she can hold the cultural whip hand over Britain. She detracts herself from the in-group the moment she can claim kind of victim status. And so lots of people don't consider themselves to be our neighbours or, or incorporated. And so we should be a lot more discerning about the kinds of people that we bring over here just on the grounds of values and whether or not they want to hate us and rape young white girls who didn't do anything to them. Uh, I would suggest that that's very sensible, but again, I will be marginalised as far right. Uh, speaking of marginalised as far right, this I'll move on to Polly Toynbee's right now, Polly Toynbee, I, I tweeted during the actual event itself, uh, Toynbee's had a, an, in, an interesting take. Uh, she said, the reason most of the migrants are here, because we want them. Now, I was never asked was a meme for a reason. It's a very powerful statement, and it means that I did not consent to mass demographic and cultural change on my doorstep particularly because, one, I was born into it. I was born after 1997 when something happened. But also because for the last decade and a half, the British public have voted for the promise to bring immigration down to the tens of thousands, a direct manifesto commitment from David Cameron in 2010. And every conservative leader since has said that they will bring immigration down and then said we've got record increases in the influx of foreign dependents coming into the country. So there has been a seismic betrayal without any democratic consent. And so the idea that this is the case, that these people are wanted, that they're all doctors, lawyers, and engineers, when I think it's only 17% of the NHS are actually made up of migrants. And last year, we let in 70,000 people on care worker visas, and it only filled 11,000 places. Uh, Yet no, no. I mean, the irony should not be lost on anyone that Toynbee was literally so deaf she couldn't hear Katie Ball's questions. The boomer did not hear the criticisms. Is anyone surprised at that? But but all right, okay. So then she goes on to say, is immigration good for Britain? Well, we can't do without it. Now, that is important. Uh, nobody really disagrees with that at this point. I mean, we could do without it if not for our present economic system and the mind virus of universal liberalism infecting uh, the ethos of our elite. Now, Toynbee predicated her argument 
on the point that if you would like to keep the Atlee institutions, so the NHS and social welfare, and if you'd like the global neoliberal economy that Thatcher set in motion, the Blair accelerated, saying that, well, to try and debate globalization is as futile as debating if autumn should follow the summer, then you need mass immigration. You need the mass importing of cheap labor. And somehow that enriches everything, even though we've got record immigration, but we're in a recession. And none of the audience, nor the panelists, actually disagreed in saying, yeah, we, we don't really care about any of that. Yeah, we can totally reform the NHS. We can totally reform social care. Because what's more important than these sclerotic institutions shambling on like some kind of Thatcherite zombie is actually the fact that we are an independent country. We were a wonderful country. We have always been better than our neighbors and various nations around the world based on our ethos and our national character and our culture. That's the reason why so many people have wanted to come here is our peace, our prosperity, our art, and our sense of standards and propriety. They predated the diversity coming over. Uh, Cheddar Man was not, in fact, black, sorry to report. Uh, Peter Dukes will be crying into his hands at uh, this revelation, I'm sure. Um, and therefore, if we suddenly have rendered ourselves incapable of being a country without, uh, without relying on a net influx of foreign dependence, why do we deserve to exist as a country at all? In fact, I would rather return to the state of being a country that, would, that was forward-facing and self-generative and believed in itself and had a national character that was just not justified by giving endless handouts to foreigners. We are not the world's poor box, and I do not intend to be so. And again, Nobody disagreed with that. So it was very confusing as to who Toynbee and eventually Bastani thought that they were actually talking to in the room. Oh, she also said that um, they are going to stop being a they and then become us. And so, so the idea that we're just some giant incorporative melting pot as if we're America. I mean, America thinks it's an ideological nation, but obviously it rests upon the original wasp contingent that set up the country presumed all the things to be a self-evident because they were self-evident among mainly white Englishmen and Europeans or, or mostly Bible-believing Christians. Um, and then now it's fracturing apart. Uh, Britain's not like that. We're, we're an old world nation. We do have an ethnic identity. We do have a shared history. And as such, multiculturalism to us isn't a melting pot. It's a blender. So you put all these ingredients in, hit blend, and then it produces this indigestible sludge that you're told is really nutritious for you but you just can't swallow it down. And then the most powerful, in this case, illiberal element of it, the most anti-English element of it, has the strongest and the most bitter aftertaste. So you never actually want to drink it again. I'm, of course, referring to Islam, which nobody brought up by name in this debate, which I was, was quite curious. I mean, Constantine obviously alluded to it during the grooming gangs, but nobody said that we had imported Islamism. And I know this isn't a taboo that Matt shies away from because he actually cares about this. I mean, see his recent debate with Ella Whelan on GB News, where she was insisting that anyone waving a Hamas banner should not be locked up or deported. And actually, we could have a debate with the jihadians right before they bring a machete down on her neck. I'm sure that will just go swimmingly. But anyway, Toynbee has this idea that suddenly everyone will just incorporate themselves into the diverse, woolly liberal blob, this human meat organ that just sits in central London. It's not going to happen because if people don't buy into your civilization, they're not going to assimilate. Instead, they're going to try and conquer and they're going to seek your vulnerabilities, particularly your unilateral multiculturalism and your unilateral tolerance to everyone, but then intolerance towards you. And they're just going to take over and you're going to be as Schmidt said of liberalism, uh, incapable of foreseeing it because you've rendered all conceptions of the good to the private sphere and presumed yourself neutral and supreme. Well, turns out not everyone agrees with you in many violent fashions. She also turned around and said that the small boat arrivals are a small proportion of immigration. Yes, as Constantine points out, that's because we have had record numbers of legal migration, which everyone objects to. And even if we say it's a small proportion, you know, like 45,000 people every year traveling across the channel, that would constitute an invading army at any other time. I mean, bear in mind, that's, blimey, uh, a lot of that is more immigration than we've seen between 1066 and the 1960s, just in one year via illegal routes. So, no, no, Mrs. I need my coffee served at Pratt. She was also roundly booed. I mean, guilty. I sort of led that charm. Because when Matt Goodwin brought up Abdul Azidi, she said that he should be ashamed of himself bringing up an anecdote. Right. Well, if you're going to allow routes for people to enter the country by criminal means, you're going to get criminals. Shouldn't really be of any surprise. Again, wolf in sheep's clothing. I would just imagine that she knows this and is being deliberately misleading or obfuscating so to maintain her narrative of 
woolly egalitarianism and universality. Uh, Constantine rightly pointed out that if it were your child doused in acid, you wouldn't call it an anecdote, now would you? Toynbee also then called a bunch of people the far right, and Constantine brought up the fact that he has Jewish members of his family that were killed in the Holocaust, and so to use that as a pejorative to immediately conjure up the uh, imagination of the, the Nazis is what Rene Camus would call the second career of Adolf Hitler, or as my friend Ralph Schollhammer would, would say, the politicians think, what would Hitler do and then do the opposite? To invoke that spectral demon of the 20th century to marginalize the majority of the British public who say, oh, I don't really want that many immigrants in the country because it's driving down my wages and making my local neighborhood look completely unrecognizable and inhospitable. Uh, Constantine said that's a despicable thing to do from his own standpoint. Yeah, yeah, quite. But anyway, um, speaking speaking a bit further, I want to get onto a little bit of what Bastani said just before we move on to the, the next topic. Uh, I'm going to connect this by pointing out that Toynbee spoke about, again, the NHS and social care. Now, I will say social care has not been great recently, has it? Uh, I mean, for example, there was this World Health Organization study, here we go, that said that uh, two-thirds of people, this is a meta-analysis, now this includes other countries as well, like the US, but I would imagine that this is something similar because cultural antagonisms, imported labor, low wages, and Unfortunately, quite a few people who might not be as compassionate to the dementia patient that they're taking care of, when the dementia patient gets confused and lashes out, might have a violent reaction. It says that two-thirds, so 64 point something percent, of care workers have admitted to abusing a patient. Let that sink in. Two-thirds of care workers have said, I have abused my own patients in institutional care settings. Is that what we really want to be running as institutional care in our civilization? Are we going to increase the likelihood of it happening if we have a bunch of people caring for the native elderly if they do not share a culture, do not share a complexion, because that does matter to some people with a high racial in-group preference from other countries who aren't quite as liberal, and don't even share a language? Because do you remember that woman uh, who was in her 90s, a dementia patient, who got stuck on a stairlift, and her Romanian, and I believe it was Bangladeshi care workers, were on the phone to 111 and couldn't decide uh, decipher the difference between breathing and bleeding because they couldn't speak English. So your relatives will literally die for the sake of diversity. Great. I think we don't need nor want that level of immigration. Thank you very much. And, and Goodwin agreed. He just said, I don't want to be taking care of anyone who doesn't speak English. Thank you for watching that clip from Tomlinson Talks. If you liked that and you would like to see more, you can get the full 90-minute show every week on a Wednesday afternoon, live from 3 p.m., only on lotuseaters.com and all of the other content that my colleagues produce behind the paywall for as little as £5 a month. Thank you very much for supporting us, and I hope to see you there. Until next time, goodbye.